Okay, welcome back to our patent series. And again, this is about bridging knowledge for everybody watching. And I'm so grateful that we have intellectual properties attorney, patent attorney extraordinaire, Shantavia Johnson, joining us once again to talk about somebody who did something back in the day. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. It's always good to see you. You look beautiful as always. And this will be a wonderful conversation. So I'm excited to be here today and to talk about this person who everybody should know named Benjamin Montgomery. Are you familiar with Benjamin Montgomery and his story? I never know. Tell me, who is Benjamin Montgomery? Oh my gosh. So this is someone everybody needs to know and understand and for a specific reason. And that specific reason is because particularly during American slavery, black inventors, many of them enslaved or formerly enslaved would create things that not only shaped, uh, American economic success, but also just created this innovation ecosystem that otherwise the country would not have had. And so Benjamin Montgomery was one of those. He never received a patent because he was enslaved, but he's got a really, really unique, interesting story that we just have to talk about today. Yeah. All right, so he was in bond, born in bondage? He was. So he was born into slavery in 1819, and he invented something called a, it's called a steamboat propeller. And what was unique about this particular steamboat propeller was that it was designed for shallow water. This was in like the late 1850s. And what was so important about having a steamboat propeller that could go through shallow water is because these steamboats would deliver all the supplies people needed to stay alive. So food, other necessities, they were often delivered in these shallow waterways to different plantations and settlements. So if the, bo if the boats would get stuck, people wouldn't be able to get their food, they wouldn't be able to get their medical supplies for days or weeks or maybe even longer. So it was an important invention for many reasons. And he came up with that but he could not get a patent. He tried. He couldn't get a patent because he was enslaved. Yeah, as you're saying this, I'm thinking if a person's in bondage, you, 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 we have these very, very definitive ways that we look at people in bondage based on roots, underground, mm -hmm. you know, all of the TV shows that have shown us in Amistad, the movies. How does a person in bondage try to get a patent? Like, what mm -hmm. does that process lo even look like? You, you know, you don't imagine you have any kind of rights or any kind of agency to be able to go and apply for a patent. Right. So this is interesting. Uh, this is interesting because in particular, Benjamin Montgomery was enslaved by a very, very wealthy person. His name was... Um, he, uh, his name was Joseph Davis, and Joseph Davis was the brother of Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis went on to become the first president of the Confederate States of America. So there was a lot of money. This is a very, very wealthy uh, slave owner. And we don't have a lot of details about the intricacies and ins and outs, but I assume it had to do with Joseph Davis wanting to be able to take credit for that invention and make money off of it. And I know that's the case because after Benjamin Montgomery was rejected because of his status as an enslaved person, Joseph Montgomery tried to apply for a patent and his brother Jefferson Davis tried to apply for a patent on the same innovation. Wait a minute. So back up a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> Tony Shantavia Johnson. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, could he go down to City Hall? I mean, like, did he have the right to go down to City Hall and apply for Like, how did he even know to, to right. apply for it? Like, I'm just like, you're, you're in bondage. They, mm -hmm. You can't read. It's illegal, right? It's illegal to know how to read. When do you even have time? Okay, I invented this thing. I know that I should get a patent for it. When is that conversation? At? Like there's mm -hmm. so many stories of, of blanks that we can't possibly probably fill in because the conversations, you know, no one wrote it down. No one told the story about how this man said, oh, I can, I oh, mm -hmm. you can get a patent for that. Okay. And then money. Cause you're, you're bondage. You're, right. you're in bondage. You are money. Did he get paid? That's exactly right. So, so this is interesting. And what I can tell you is he and Joseph Davis had a very unique relationship for many reasons that we can explore. But I presume what it was, was Joseph Davis, who owned Benjamin Montgomery, 
wanted to leverage that patented technology. So I assume it had more to do with Joseph Davis realizing the value of whatever Ben Montgomery had invented and him taking those steps on behalf of Benjamin Montgomery as the inventor. Oh. And that and that is why the the patent application was rejected. It was rejected because Benjamin Montgomery as a person who was enslaved under American law at that time, you had to be able to say in a patent application that you were the citizen of a country and people who were enslaved could not be considered citizens of a country. So Benjamin Montgomery was not a citizen of any country and could not get a patent. But I assume Joseph Davis filed it on his behalf. How do we know that Benjamin, so, you know, as many inventions happen, mm -hmm. black people invented, white people took credit, we'll never know. We'll never mm -hmm. know how many inventions actually happened that we, do. we we just won't know. How do we know about this story? So the reason this story is, there's so many reasons the story is important. One of the first reasons, and this is how we know this is true, one of the first reasons the story is important is because Jefferson Davis in particular, when he became the president of the Confederate States of America, uh, the Confederate States of America created their own constitution. It basically looked exactly like the United States Constitution, but there were only a few amendments. And one of the first amendments signed by Jefferson Davis for this constitution of the Confederate States of America was it revolved around slave owners being able to get patents for the inventions of their slaves. And he had had that experience with Benjamin Montgomery and he didn't like it. And that was one of the first things, wow. one of the first pieces, uh, one of the first amendments to this new constitution in the Confederate States revolved around inventions because Jefferson Davis thought slave owners should be able to own the things that their, their people that they owned invented. If you think about the, the, because I know you help people form businesses and you help people mm -hmm. grow their businesses. Shantavia Johnson is here. Uh, to take somebody else's intellectual property and then build, build a country or an empire or you know, wealth, generational wealth. And to want to put that, because most of the laws it revolved around us and our bodies and our, and mm -hmm. our worth, you know, they had to put it in the law, you know, where we got to live even after in enslavement, you know, who got land grants, you know, who got the new deal, you know, all of these things that they put into law wasn't mm -hmm. just like racism and whites only and coloreds only, but it was put into law so that he did that first speaks to the value of, of intellectual property. Oh, of course, for sure. And if you look at the history of the United States, when the United States was founded as the country that we know it today, obviously, this land was here long before any, any of us ever, ever got here. But when the United States was founded, one of the first articles in the United States Constitution was the, the Patent Act, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution, revolved around patents and innovation. And it was because the founding fathers of the United States understood the value of intellectual property. And it was the reason, truly, one of the primary reasons the United States went from this brand new country that you know, was basically tied to the crown, to its own economic superpower, is because of its innovation, because of its ability to join the international stage and become a major trading partner and a major economic power. And it happened because of intellectual property, because of patents. You think about Benjamin Montgomery's patent. Well, he didn't get a patent, but his innovation with mm -hmm. his the ability to be able to, and I'm sure during the war, the, the, the transport of soldiers and weapons and food to those soldiers, instrumental on the back, mm -hmm. literally of, of a person that was in bondage. That was his brain power. That was his brain power. And this is my favorite part of the story. So before the war ended, Joseph Davis 
fleed his plantation. So this was in Mississippi. They were scared. They were scared of Union troops. They fleed the plantation in Mississippi before the Union troops even got there. But they left all of these enslaved people. So Benjamin Montgomery took over control of the entire plantation because nobody else was there to do so. And what he did during this time was he allowed Black people- Wait, Octavia, hold on, hold on. It's like the British are coming. The, the Union is coming. The Union is coming. And the Joseph Davis leaves. They pack up and left. They pack up and leave. And they, they pack up and leave. They, they left everything. And they left everything. Probably took their, their wealth with them and money and whatever, candlesticks and gold <laughs> and silver, and left the Black people on the, on the plantation. Left the Black folks there. But here's what the Black people did. These Black folks, and with Benjamin Montgomery really as the leader, of this community, this plantation that was hundreds of acres. He created, and so you know I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I love entrepreneurs. I work with entrepreneurs. He created basically like what we see today in these co-working spaces. He created a place for Black people in Mississippi to come and run their businesses and make money so long as they paid him rent. And so Benjamin Montgomery created this Black enclave of, of first people who were enslaved and then once uh, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, freed, newly freed Black people allowed them to run their businesses. And they didn't just run their businesses. They were very, very, very successful. So successful, in fact, that at the height of Benjamin Montgomery's leadership of this plantation, Benjamin Montgomery was literally one of the most successful planters in Mississippi. And Mississippi, of course, was one of the wealthiest uh, slave states in the country. So he literally was probably one of the most successful planters in America at that time. Wow. So he had a co-working space. He had mm -hmm. a co-op, co-op farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when the union did come, why didn't they break it up? You know, because what, what had happened, you know, especially in those years after the, the South lost, mm -hmm. you know, that period of reconstruction. Was right. he wrapped up in that period of reconstruction? Did they leave him alone? Did they let him continue to do what he was doing? Yeah, so this part is hard. I'm, I'm not sure why the Union soldiers left them alone, but they basically did. So, so after the war ended, Let's back up a little. So the war ends, Joseph Davis is gone, but after the war ends, Joseph Davis comes back. And for some reason- All my stuff back. <laughs> right? Well, that's the interesting thing. He comes back, he apparently has had some kind of change of heart, and he sells the entire plantation to Benjamin Montgomery. And wow. I'm not sure why, but he sells this plantation to Benjamin Montgomery Montgomery continues to build this black owned operation becomes one of the wealthiest planters in Mississippi. And what happens shortly thereafter, Benjamin Montgomery has a son named Isaiah. Isaiah buys 800 acres of land and they form a black town. It is one of the oldest black communities in America called Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Oh, I know I was in Mississippi two, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a voter registration drive. We went to Jackson State, we were doing all mm -hmm. these reviews. Bam, you, we came up, you know, up 95, hit, hit Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I went to the museum there. They have a beautiful museum, one of the best museums I've ever been to, that museum, uh, curated by a Black woman. Amazing, um, mm -hmm. amazing, amazing. And in a section, they talked about Mud by, by you, Mound by you. Mound by you. Mm -hmm. In one of the most wealthiest, successful towns in America, rivaling yep. Black Wall Street, self-sufficient, and I, you know, it, it started sparking because we don't hear about these. We mm -hmm. don't hear about these. Things. So that was him. That so was I him. Do, so I do know Benjamin Montgomery. <laughs> you do. I know, I know the story. Okay. So That's right. Mount, Mount Bayou. So Mount Bayou was this 800 acres of property that allowed Black people in Mississippi shortly after Reconstruction or during that time. This was around 1887 that the town was founded they were allowed to operate in their space. And as I understand it, the white people in the surrounding area basically left them alone. They were self-sufficient. They, as I understand, Isaiah Montgomery and some of the other leaders in the town, they essentially negotiated with the white communities around them to say, hey, we will not seek 
certain things if you just leave us alone, if you just give us an opportunity to do what we are doing for ourselves, we will not seek certain things. And they were allowed to do that. They thrived during this time. The town is still around. It's got maybe a few hundred residents now. But they existed in that way, self-sufficient for many years. And if I remember from the museum, they built a railroad or something in the domain and went right, because they were off the tra train tracks, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. And that's why they were able, because much much like um, Tulsa, near, near railway so that people can get in and out they they eminent domain that town out mm -hmm. of out of power so that they mm -hmm. were cut off from being able to get goods and services and, and trade right that was a strategy used in many cities in the united yeah. states particularly southern cities for sure well we must keep talking and i appreciate you and as you as you contemplate this shantavia johnson uh and and helping people build businesses you know, mm -hmm. what advice do you have to, to protect folk from, you know, these kind of schemes that seem to keep, keep happening? Well, so the first thing is to recognize the value of your intellectual capital and to protect that intellectual capital. Think of everything you create as part of yourself. I mean, Jay-Z said it best, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. And you need to think about the things that you create as part of the business of you and recognize the value in those things, protect those things, and then figure out ways to leverage what you've created to not only improve other people's lives, of course, because I mean, everything I do, I do out of service, but also create economic independence for yourself. We just celebrated Juneteenth, July 4th is coming up. We'll be talking about independence a lot. Economic independence has to be one of our goals. Okay, well, you know, I'm here for it. Um, who's, who are we gonna talk about next? All right, I guess I got to tune in for that. Got to tune in. <laughs> follow you, Shantavia. So you can follow me on social everywhere at Shantavia, J-E-S-Q. That's S-H-O-N-T-A-V-I-A, the letter J, E-S-Q. You can also find all of my work at Shantavia.com. S-H-O-N-T-A-V-I-A.com. I also have a podcast of the same name, The Shantavia Show, where I teach people how to build businesses from ground zero. And they can find that anywhere. Everywhere. Anywhere. Everywhere you get your podcast, you can also get it at Shantavia.com. All right. And subscribe, 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 and like, hit the like button because she deserves that. All right. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your intellectual property. <laughs> thank you, Karen. And thank you for yours. You've been giving people intellectual capital for a long time now and making people a lot smarter each and every day. Well, so I appreciate the work you're doing, too. I thank you, but people have to pick up their mats. I'm just putting it out there where the goats can get it. <laughs> thank you, Shantavia. Thank you, Karen.